Good morning, FBC Bernie. It is good to be with you this morning. My name is Nick Person, and I had the privilege of being with your students the entirety of this weekend, and it's good to be here. I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and so you have the Atlanta connection here this morning and all weekend. I currently live in Nashville, Tennessee with my family. I get to be a pastor locally there. I am married to an incredible woman who has put up with me for 18 years now, and she is a saint among women because I'm a lot to deal with, y'all. But uh, she still likes me, praise God, and so I'm going to plan on making sure that stays that way. We have three beautiful kids. My oldest, her name is Ava. She is 15 years old. She's a freshman. She cheerleads. She does track and field. She is a lovely, lovely, lovely human, and she will never date. Um, (laughs) Yes, I will punch a boy in the throat. I will do it. Um, But she is lovely. And uh, it is a privilege to be her daddy. My oldest son, his name is Jackson. He is 13 years old. He turns 14 in March. He likes gaming. He likes baseball. He is fun to be around. He teaches me a lot to think in a different way. And it's an honor to be his daddy. And our youngest, our wild card, wild man, his name is Nash. He is nine years old. And y'all, we got tired at the third child. And so... (laughs) There's some evidence of there, but we're going to keep leaning in. We're going to keep praying. But he really completes our family. He is living his best life in the third grade, and it has truly, truly been good. One of the things I love the most, one of the things I feel most privileged is to be a husband to my wife and a dad to my kids. And I have learned to love that more and more as I continue to walk. Thank you for clapping for that. And it's just true. I don't always get it right. Um, And so we have been living in Nashville for the last seven years, and it has been great for us. And so you kind of know where my family is now, but I would like to give you a glimpse of where this started. Like I said, I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and, and being in Atlanta, Georgia, on Sunday mornings, you would dress up to go to church, y'all. You would dress up. I mean, you would bring out the best. And I remember just getting dressed when I was a kid for church. My mom was like, your suit got to be right. Your tie got to be right. And sometimes my mom would rock a church hat, y'all. That was what kind of... And so just to get a glimpse of this, Easter probably, I want to say almost 30 years ago, probably a little bit more, this is what the scene looked like. Check out this picture. (laughs) Woo! Ooh, look at that hair, y'all. Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> See, you don't know to appreciate something till it's gone, right? <laughs> My mom was the one growing up that made sure we were in church every Sunday. She taught Sunday school. And you look at this picture and you go, man, look at them. They look happy. They look healthy. But what's interesting about my mom is a picture can only tell you so much. See, my mom was broken in a lot of different ways. She had some mental things going on. She had some physical things going on. And this picture is a great picture, but it doesn't tell the true story of my mom. My mom did some beautiful things in the life of our family, but also my mom also had the ability to wreak some chaos in our house as well. And whenever I look at this picture, I just go, man, there was so much going on behind the scenes. My mom didn't always get it right. My mom sometimes caused all kinds of chaos, but my mom taught me something, and this was hard for me to reconcile in my head. Because my mom, as capable as she was of causing some chaos in our life, she was also capable of encouraging us and pointing us to Jesus in some fantastic ways. And I believe sometimes we have a hard time as humans reconciling how can someone be capable of so much chaos while at the same time being capable of so much goodness. But if we're really honest, that's all of us, right? Something that I took away from my mom that I learned that has impacted me, and I've been thinking a lot about her because the anniversary of her passing away was on Wednesday. It has been 18 years since I said, see you later, see you in glory, mom. So I've been thinking about her a lot lately in this season, and it's crazy that you don't ever get over someone going before you. Because the impact on their life, you just remember and you learn how to navigate it. 
But I've been thinking a lot about her, and my mom, in spite of all the things, she chose to worship the king anyways. Her worship wasn't contingent on everything going well. Her worship wasn't contingent on a right season. Her worship wasn't contingent on her not walking through a storm. Something I learned about my mom and that I watched her day in and day out. No matter the struggle, no matter what she was going through, she still fixed her eyes on the king and walked with him. Now, there were days when it was a crawl and not a walk. But what she did do was she said, you know what? I know who the king is. I know he's on the throne. And so based on what I know to be true, I'm going to worship him anyway. And you might be thinking, okay, Nick, when you say worship, what do you mean by worship? I think Paul David Tripp, he's an author and a pastor. He gives a very good definition of worship. He says this, human beings by their very nature are worshipers. Worship is not something that we do, it defines who we are. You cannot divide human beings into those who worship and those who don't. Everybody worships. It's just a matter of what or whom we serve. My mom, not perfectly, but worshiped the king through it all. She fixed her eyes on the king and she walked towards the king. Today, we're going to jump into the gospel of Mark, and we're going to see a lady named Mary, the sister of Lazarus, the sister of Martha. She is going to show us a posture of what it looks like to worship anyway. Despite what people say, despite what people think, despite the season she was walking in, she had a resolve that she was going to worship the king. And you might go, why would she have a resolve to do that? Because the king is worthy. In the midst of a broken world, the king is worthy. And I think we got to understand the king did not break the world, everybody. Sin did. And I think as we navigate life, sometimes we go, hey, King, are you really good? Jesus, are you really good? He is. And he is redeeming and reconciling, and he is at work. And so we're going to see a picture of what it looks like to worship anyway. We're going to be in Mark chapter 14, and we're going to supplement some with John chapter 12 because it tells the same story in that gospel. And as we navigate, a question you're going to have to answer when you walk out of this place today is, are you going to choose to worship anyway? Despite the ailments, despite the pain, and I'm not talking about ignoring that, but knowing that God is still on the throne, are you going to choose to worship him in the midst of a storm anyway? I can't answer that for you. I can only answer that for myself. As we prepare to engage with the word of God, let's pray. Father God, thank you for who you are and what you do. Lord, my prayer for us is over the next few moments is that we can fix our eyes on you. Lord, that you will remind us of what is true and that we will have a resolve that because you are good, because you have redeemed, because you have saved us, you are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our lives. You are worthy of our everything in spite of what may may be going on around us. So Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. And Jesus, we pray all these things in your awesome and amazing name. Amen. Mark chapter 14, we're going to begin in verse 1. Let me kind of give you some context of what's going on. Jesus has been walking around with his disciples. He has been causing chaos because he is doing things that people don't like. He is healing people. He's hanging out with sinners. How dare he? And people are being bothered because this is not the way that a rabbi should act. But here is Jesus claiming to be the son of God. And there are people that are saying, that's blasphemy. You can't truly be the son of God. But all the evidence of Jesus' life spoke to the fact that he was the son of God, that he is God in the flesh. And his disciples are following him. And they had no idea what that invitation would lead to. They're walking around, they're doing these things. God is empowering them to do miracles as well in his name. And they are like, what is going on? They find themselves at a meal, the Passover meal, and we're getting close towards the end of Jesus' life. So Jesus goes and he's gonna hang out with some close friends. What I love about that is Jesus was fully God and fully human. 
He had community. He had friends. So we're going to drop into this story in Mark chapter 14, and we're going to see Jesus hanging out with his community and about to share a meal that is going to illustrate what he's about to do. I love it. Verse 1. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Here's what's interesting. Let me pause right here for a second. I think sometimes we look at the world and go, man, the world is going crazy. May I remind us that the world has always been broken? <laughs> And I know that we're more aware of the brokenness because of social media and the news, but y'all, it's always been a hot mess. Even in the times of Jesus, they are plotting to kill him during the Passover festival where they're supposed to be remembering how God has provided for them. And what they are scheming in the background is, hey, thank you God for providing for us, but we're about to provide some for Jesus, right? And so it's always been a mess. And so My encouragement to us is let's not fret too much because the Lord is in control. Verse number one of John chapter 12. I'm going to give you just a little bit more insight from the gospel of John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived. John is given some insight of where Jesus is hanging out and who he's hanging out with. Whom Jesus had raised from the dead. I love that little line. Y'all remember Lazarus, he was dead, but Jesus said, get up, and he came out. <laughs> he was just hanging out with him. He was hanging out with a formerly dead man and eating at his table. I love it. Verse number two. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, of course she was, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. I love that John's just going to give a little bit more insight and a little bit more of an intimate view of what's going on. Let's jump back to Mark chapter 14, verse 3. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some more insight from John 12, verse 3. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Can we pause for a second? And I know some of you are going to judge that I'm about to talk about hair, but I need you to keep your judgment for a second. (laughs) I have two beautiful ladies that live in my house, my wife and my daughter. They spend some time, some money, some intentionality on their hair. Amen, ladies? So for me, when I read this line, it makes me stop for a second and pause. Because I'm thinking to myself, knowing what I do know about hair, knowing what I do know about the intentionality, knowing what I do know, this is a very big deal. That Mary would be willing not only to give something so expensive and costly, but to wipe the feet of her king with her hair. Here's something else you got to understand. At this time, they were rocking sandals. Do you understand that? You ever walk around at the beach or off-road in some sandals? What happens when you get home and take off your sandals? Let's just be honest. Your feet are crusty, your feet are crusty, y'all. They are. So here is Jesus walking around, doing what he's doing, blessing the people. He gets to dinner, and yes, he probably would have washed his feet, but she's going to anoint and worship him, and she's going to pour expensive nard on him, and then she's going to use something that's very, very important to her, and she's going to use it to worship her king. That should make us pause and go, huh, why? Why would she do such an audacious act of worship? I would argue that it's not so audacious, it's fitting. And the house was filled with the fragrance of her perfume. A jar full of pure nard would have been very, very, very costly. But yet she is anointing Christ with this perfume and with her 
See, the name Christ means anointed one. So if you think about it, she's doing the exact thing that she needs to do in the presence of the anointed one. What is she doing? Anointing him. Mary brought her best and her all to the one who was worthy of it all. The reason she was willing to do this is because she had seen Jesus call her brother from death to life. You have to imagine that that would lead you to a posture of worship. I have seen what he is able to do. I've seen him step into the mess of my life and change the atmosphere. I'm sure Mary can help herself, y'all. When she had an opportunity, she's like, I am taking it because he is worthy. She gave her all to the anointed one. And it says something that I think is so beautiful. Don't miss it. The fragrance of the offering filled the house. Her worship filled the house. I think the same is true of our worship today, y'all. When we worship our king, it can't help but fill the house. And people take notice of the one who is anointed, the one who is worshiped, the one who is worthy. Mark 14, verse 4. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Here's something that I've learned to be true. True worship will cause outrage from those who do not value Christ as they should. Sometimes when you choose to worship, There are going to be critics, y'all. Why would you raise your hands after all you've been through? Are you sure that God is good? Because look at what's going on around you. You're singing way too loud. You need to calm that down. Your hands are lifted a little too high. I can't even see the screens. Hear me, and this should give you rest and peace. There is always going to be somebody with something to say when you choose to worship your king in spirit and truth. Worship the king anyways. How could we not? It makes me think of King David. He was married to Saul's daughter. I don't know if you remember the scene in 2 Samuel chapter 6. The king is worshiping his king. And I love David's response, and it's worth us taking a little time to see this response because I think his response is fitting, and I think his response is in line with Mary's response to the king. In verse 12 of 2 Samuel chapter 6, it says this, Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obi-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring the ark of God from the house of Obi-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Note, with rejoicing. Why was he rejoicing? Because the presence of God was in his midst. He couldn't help himself. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. I want y'all to think about this. Worship just broke out in the streets. They took six steps, and David's sacrificing things. He's like, "Woo! for God be the glory. Six steps. That probably took a long time in my calculation. But David wasn't concerned about the time. David wasn't concerned about what people were thinking. David was just concerned at fixing his attention on his king, who had been good, who had blessed him, who had called him from the shepherd's field to the throne. And so he had no choice but to worship. And he's inviting those around him and going, hey, guys, we got to celebrate. We got to sacrifice. We got to make offerings because our king is good. Verse 14. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. With all of his might. He was not holding back anything. While he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. Verse 16. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched 
from a window. Can we pause for a second? I want you to notice something that I haven't noticed all the time, but I'm beginning to notice more and more about this scene. Notice that Mikhail chose to stay in the house when she was invited to the streets to worship the king too. But instead of joining it, instead of being a part, she was a critique from up in the window. She's looking down on this scene and she is judging what is going on instead of participating in what was going on. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. We know what that's like. Ladies, y'all know what that's like. You know when sometimes when your husband acts a fool, you're like, I despise you in my heart right now. <laughs> they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Notice that the atmosphere was better because David chose to worship the king. Those around him were impacted by his worship. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of the Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. I imagine they went to their homes singing as well. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. Going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. Y'all can almost hear this conversation in your head, can't you? I imagine David walking in the house and going, hey, honey, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. You were dancing in the street in your drawers. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Verse 21. It's one of my favorite responses in all of the narrative of Scripture. David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father. That just got real or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. David's response summed up was this, I am going to worship anyway. Verse 6 of Mark 14. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. See, Jesus knew what was coming just around the corner. And he's experiencing Mary, his friend, worship him. And it's costly. Hear me. It's costly. Worship is costly. To live your life in response to the king is costly. But it was a cost she was willing to pay. Why? Because the king is worthy. Amen. True worship is beautiful to the king. Jesus said, leave her alone. She's the one who's getting it right. She's the one who sees me for who I really am. Leave her alone and let her worship. True worship means you offer all that you have. Y'all, this is the good stuff as well as the ugly stuff. God, that past hurts. Those past mistakes, I'm going to surrender and give them to you because in your hands you can redeem them. Lord, my brokenness, my shortcomings, I'm going to give them to you because you are worthy. Lord, this current valley that I'm walking through, I'm going to trust you with it. I'm going to worship you through it. Lord, you can have it all because you are worthy in the storm and in the calm. You are worthy. 
And y'all, when I think back to my mom, and I think about my mom would sing in the choir at church, and I remember watching her as a kid raise her hands as she's singing these songs to the king, and I thought to myself, I know what's going on at home. I've seen the tears. I've seen the struggle. But yet here you are in a moment of vulnerability and honesty, worshiping the king anyway. And I think sometimes the thing that keeps us from worshiping anyways is this thing called comparison. What they're offering is better than what I'm offering. I think we're missing the point in in its entirety. God is inviting you to offer what you have. Not what your neighbor has. Not what your friend has. Not what your mama and them have. But what you have. And here's what is true, church. We all have something to offer to the king. The question is, are you willing to offer it and worship anyway? Verse 9. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Jesus says, they're going to be telling this story for years to come. It's going to encourage my people. It's going to encourage my kids. It's going to encourage those who are not here now but are to come. Y'all, we are those people. And here we are, years and years later, listening, seeing how Mary chose to worship her king, and we go, are we going to take our cue from Mary and go and do likewise? True worship lasts. It is rooted in eternity and not the temporary. Another quote from Paul David Tripp that I love. The good news of the kingdom is not freedom from hardship, suffering, and loss. It is the news of a redeemer who has come to rescue me from myself. His rescue produces change that fundamentally alters my response to these inescapable realities. The redeemer turns rebels into disciples, fools into humble listeners. He makes cripples walk again in him. We can face life and respond with faith, love, and hope. And as he changes us, he allows us to be a part of what he is doing in the lives of others. As you respond to the Redeemer's work in your life, you can learn to be an instrument in his hands. Mary was an instrument in his hands. Verse 10, let's close out. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Something we see about Judas and Mary that's different. Judas worshipped what was temporary, and it led him to death. Mary worshipped what was eternal, and it led to life. If Jesus willingly endured what he endured and suffered all that he suffered to be the perfect substitute, doing for you what you have could never done for yourself, would you not be willing to make sacrifices to him? Paul David Tripp. The aroma of Mary's worship pointed to the anointed king. Our cornerstone verse this weekend with our students has been Romans 12, 1 through 2. And I think it's fitting for us to end this message with the same bedrock verse that we have been walking on this entire weekend. And Romans 12, verse 1 says this. Therefore, in light of all the things, the good things, the bad things, the mediocre things, the struggles, the storms, the valleys, the mountaintops. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Whose mercy? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't look horizontally. Don't look around, but look up. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's pleasing will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let us not conform to the pattern of this world, but may our worship be true and proper, and may we be a people that worship anyway. I'm going to invite the band to make their way back up. I remember riding in the car with my mom often, and one of my mom's favorite musical artists is a gospel singer named C.C. Wine. It's going to get an amen, y'all, C.C. Mm. She loved her some C.C. Winans. So I've known C.C. Winans back in the day when it was B.B. and C.C., amen. But my mom had this song that she would go back to and go back to and go back to. I remember riding in the car with her and we were listening to a CD for the young people in the room. That's what we used to listen to music on. So I remember we were listening to this C.C. Winans CD, and she went to this song called Alabaster Box, which is telling the story of Mary, Lazarus' sister. And I remember whenever this song would come on, my mom would just go to a different place, it felt like. I remember watching her as she was singing along to this song, and I remember that there would always be tears that were streaming down her face, and I didn't understand as a teenager what was going on fully. I didn't understand why would she be crying right now. I mean, this is a good song, and it's a great story, but why would it move her to tears? But as I look back on that time with my mom, I'm realizing that the words of the song and the life that Mary lived was reminding her of her own journey. That there were people that had all kinds of things to say about her. There were struggles that were not pretty. There was all kinds of brokenness going on, but she still wanted to worship her king anyways. So I recognized that that song was more like a journal entry for her than just a song. Some of the lyrics of the song are this. The room grew still as she made her way to Jesus. She stumbles through the tears that made her blind. She felt such pain, some spoke in anger, heard folks whisper, there's no place for her or her kind. Still on, she came through the shame that flushed her face until at last she knelt before his feet. And though she spoke no words, everything she said was heard as she poured her love for the master from her box of alabaster. So I've come to pour my praise on him like oil from Mary's alabaster box. So don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry them with my hair. Because you weren't there the night he found me. You did not feel what I felt when he wrapped his love all around me. And you don't know the cost, not of this oil, in my alabaster box. Hear me, church. I know the struggle is real. I know that there have been dark days, and you might currently be walking through them today. Your king is seated on the throne because he has finished the work. He has made a way. He has answered your biggest need with not just an offering he had, but with his very life and his blood to make you new, to make you whole, to redeem you, to restore you, to give you a seat at his table. And so I know the storms rage and they will continue and I know the valleys will come and they will, but I want us to remember that he is worthy. In the storm, in the calm, he is worthy. When times are dark, when times are bright, he is worthy. May we be a people that fix our eyes on the king and say, you can have it all. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, 
in this room, I know we have people in the midst of valleys, in the midst of storms. We also have those on mountaintops. And Lord, maybe even in this room, there are people that have been looking for hope. Lord, I pray that you will remind them that hope has found them. That you came looking for us. Like the father looking for the prodigal son, you have been watching over the horizon, waiting. And Lord, when we take a turn to you, what I love about your posture is you don't keep it cool, calm, and collected, but you run towards us. Lord, you've always been a king who runs towards what is lost and what is broken, and you are not afraid of the mess. And so, Lord, maybe today be the day where someone says, it's time to come home. It's time to say yes to the invitation from the king. Maybe for someone else in this place, it's time to let go of what so easily entangles and for us to run in freedom. Maybe today it's we're bringing the hurt and the brokenness and saying, you can have it. I've been holding it too long and it has grown a root of bitterness, but today I'm letting it go. Lord, I don't know the next step, but may our step be worshiping you anyway. So Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. And Jesus, we pray all these things in your name. Amen.